Hello, this is uh, Dr. Ed Perper. This is the Art of Scientific Storytelling podcast. Thank you very much for coming to listen to it. This is our second episode, and I am CEO and founder of Science Branding Communications, which is a uh, scientific storytelling agency. So what I hope is that there are people out there like me who love science and love communicating science, and that's why we created this podcast. This podcast is basically for people who want to take their scientific presentations or communication programs of various kinds to the next level. And, and what I mean by that is to have the science connect with our audience. I think many of us want the science to connect. It's a challenge to do that. And uh, that's what this podcast is all about. So I believe, and, and we at Science Branding Communications believe that storytelling is the way to do that because people are hardwired to engage in and share stories, including scientific stories. One of my favorite quotations comes from a um, neuroscientist at Stanford where I was an undergraduate, David Eagleman. He's a neuroscientist there who had actually a, a PBS series about the brain. And he said that uh, our brains are wired to receive stories. And another quotation that's sort of similar from Pamela Rutledge, uh, who's a PhD and MBA media psychologist who's uh, written books on this topic, said that stories are how we think. They're how we make meaning of life. So the idea that storytelling is special, is a special form of communication, has really gained traction, but mostly in the business world, not so much in the scientific world and in scientific communication. And that's what we're talking about in this podcast, and I hope that uh, you're interested in learning more about it. Now, turning a conventional presentation into an authentic story is not an easy process. There are a number of things you have to do right to make that happen. And one of the most important things is introducing tension uh, into a presentation to make it a story because it turns out that tension is really what makes a story a story. What makes it different than, for example, the conventional presentation or the conventional lecture? Though a lot of conventional presentations can be very organized and very nicely presented, but they don't have tension in them. They, they sort of like a series of facts and charts and data, which is very important and is very relevant, but doesn't come across as a story and therefore is not as engaging and as compelling to audiences. Now, story tension, as I mentioned, has not gotten a lot of attention in the scientific world. Novelists know about it, screenwriters, playwrights, they know about how important tension is, but not so much scientists or even communication professionals. So that's what I'm going to talk about today, using tension to turn a plain, vanilla, conventional, typical presentation into a vibrant, compelling, engaging story. And I'm going to talk about three questions in regards to that. I'm going to talk about what is story tension? What are we talking about exactly? Secondly, I'm going to talk about why should we bring tension into our presentations, our scientific presentations? Why should we be even talking about this? And thirdly, I'm going to talk about five different ways that you can actually bring and incorporate tension into a scientific presentation. There are many, many ways of doing it, and we're going to talk about five of those today. So let's get started. First of all, what are we talking about when we say story tension? What we're really talking about is the buildup of anticipation. I would even use the word suspense that keeps the audience engaged. Why is the audience engaged? Because the audience wants to know what's going to happen next. And this is like a universal human characteristic that when you present tension or some form of tension to a, an audience, if you do it you know, in a way that, that is, fits that particular audience, their sensibilities, their knowledge, you know, what they know and don't know, that they're going to want to know what happens next. 
And this is a universal thing for all stories, and it also applies to scientific stories. So it's an essential element of any compelling story, and it does involve introducing a bit of anxiety into the audience. It's basically a psychological state that you're, that you're trying to generate, and uh, people actually enjoy it to a certain degree because they know that tension is going to be relieved in a few moments. So in scientific storytelling, tension is created by presenting a problem or challenge that the audience cares about. And we're going to get into more detail about that. But story tension is not about exaggerating or distorting facts. It's about presenting those facts in a way that sparks curiosity in the audience, makes them want to know what's going to happen next. Now, so let's move to the next question, which arguably could be the first question, which is, why are we even talking about this? Why should we even talk about story tension? Some people actually say that you don't need tension or storytelling in general. Just tell people the facts, the scientific facts and the data, and that's all you need to do. But I think many of us have come to the experience that Many times, this is just not enough. It doesn't work as well as we'd like it to. And part of the reason is that people in our audiences have seen hundreds or maybe even thousands of presentations. And if the presentation is flat and basically a series of facts and data sort of serially presented one after another for 15 minutes or 30 minutes or 45 minutes, that this doesn't move people. And people check out, and that's the problem that we have that, that storytelling is the antidote to. So one of the interesting things about this area is that it's been studied scientifically at a few centers in the world. And probably I would say the leading center looking at this issue of how does storytelling affect the brain is headed by a neuroscientist by the name of Dr. Uri Hassan at Princeton. And he has given a really fantastic TED Talk, which I highly recommend, that's been seen by two or three million people about his research into the effects of storytelling on the brain. So I'm not going to go into it in detail, but I do want to just give you a little taste of it. And basically, they used functional MRI to look into the effects of storytelling on the brain. And what they found was that when we listen to a story, specific areas of the brain are activated. So our areas involved in language processing, which of course you would expect, but also storytelling activates emotional centers in the brain, decision centers in the brain. And as the story unfolds, and this is the fascinating part, the waves, the brain waves, the activated brain waves of the listener can be actually documented and observed to synchronize with the brain waves of the storyteller. And this synchronization has suggested that storytelling has a really powerful effect on both cognition and emotions. And that's how it fosters a deeper connection between the storyteller on the audience and the material and the audience. So the answer to the question, why should we care about story tension, is that it's crucial in storytelling because it engages, it teaches, it influences, it inspires the audience, and it helps keeps their attention, which as we all know is sometimes hard to do in the modern world. Now, let's go on to how. How do we do this? How do we incorporate story tension into our scientific presentations? And I want to talk about five ways of doing that. The first one is what I like to call the magic of questions. When you ask a question that the audience wants to know the answer to, but it doesn't know the answer, it might know the answer in some regard, but it doesn't know your answer and it wants it, and they want to know how you would answer this question. When you ask a question like that in a presentation, you are instantly creating a state of tension in the audience. And one of the secret sauces or the tips is to say the question, ask the question, but then pause for like five or 10 seconds even and really let the audience marinate in that question. Now, of course, the key here is to understand your audience and to know what kind of questions they're interested in. That goes without say. But you have to think about it and you have to think about where in your presentation you're going to do it. 
So here are a few examples of questions you might introduce into a scientific presentation. For example, you might ask, well, how well are we doing in treating this disease? We've been treating this disease for the last, let's say, 50 years. There's been a lot of progress. Are we really doing better? How well are we actually doing? This can be a very provocative question to clinicians, to practitioners, because they don't know how you're going to answer that question. Are you going to say that we're all doing a great job and everything is hunky-dory? Or are you going to say that things are not going so well and how are you going to deal with that? There are different ways of asking this. Are most patients achieving good outcomes? Is there is their quality of life improved by current treatments? Many diseases, of course, reduce people's quality of life. And sometimes there's good data about that. So you might show that quality of life is a big problem in this particular disease. The question is, are our current treatments improving people's quality of life? And another question you can ask is, well, we've just looked at the fact that there are some limitations to our current treatments. A good question to follow that up with might be, do we understand what's preventing current treatments from working better? This is a question that, that a clinician might ask themselves, like they might know that they're having difficulties with this particular disease and frequently their patients are not achieving the outcomes they would like. And they want to know the answer to why. Why is this happening? Why are these treatments that are approved, that have gone through all these trials, are, why aren't they working? Do, do scientists understand this? Because of course, if there's an understanding of why the treatments are not working, then that can be a clue to how to overcome these challenges. So other examples of questions can be, you know, how can this drug be so effective and yet so be well tolerated? I've had a couple of examples of projects like this that I've done over the years with particularly amazing drugs. And you show the efficacy and it's amazing, but then you want to sort of bring the audience in and rather than just showing them the efficacy data, say, okay, this is great efficacy data, but we all know that a potent drug, a very effective drug might also have side effects. Does it have side effects? How well tolerated is it? Just by asking that question, instead of just launching into the safety data or the tolerability data, can inject some tension into the story and make it a more uh, a flowing kind of story. Another thing you can do question-wise is, how did this drug get discovered? Where did, where did it come from? Sometimes there's a fascinating story lurking in the background that people will be very interested in. I was involved in a project for a multiple sclerosis drug, and when we looked into the history of where this drug came from, it was really fascinating. It had to do with a case report about two little girls who had a very rare genetic deficiency involving their immune system. And this genetic mutation that they had basically obliterated all the lymphocytes, these special white blood cells in their system. And so they had no protection against infections and they had these repeated bouts of life-threatening infections, like these two-year-old and six-year-old little girls. So you can, you, you tell that story and people get engaged, right? Because for obvious reasons. So then the story goes on that the mutation was identified and the enzyme was identified. And then someone had this bright idea that, oh, well, multiple sclerosis is driven by, you know, hyperreactive, overactivated lymphocytes. Maybe we can make a drug that simulates this genetic mutation and reduce the lymphocytes in the blood. And maybe this would be helpful to people with multiple sclerosis. This is exactly the line of thinking that led to the discovery of this drug. And so you can tell the story and then it can, it, 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 people enjoy hearing history sometimes. You don't want to overdo it and provide, you know, spend too much time on it, but it can be a really interesting a way of starting a presentation. Okay, let's go to number two. The second technique for introducing tension into a story is to present a clear problem or challenge. Now, this is something that people already do, arguably. Many people talk, many presentations involve the unmet need. We, we've, all, we've all heard that phrase, right? The unmet need. But one of the things that I found is that not enough time is given to the unmet need. It's basically sometimes like one slide or 30 seconds or a minute. It's important to 
give time and depth and show data to dramatize the problem because then your solution that you offer, whatever it may be, is going to be that much more appreciated, right? Now, one of the things, this is, it's a little bit understandable because sometimes why people resist spending more time on the problem, and that is the, the idea that, well, the audience already understands the problem. I don't, I don't need to tell them. They know the problem. This is only partly true. Although they do appreciate the problem, they, they don't necessarily know how you're going to present the problem and how you're going to present the solution to that problem. Because ideally, what you want to do is that the, the way you present the problem should be solved in the second part of your presentation in a very complementary, like a hand and glove kind of way, that the solution exactly fits the problem as you presented it. So the problem is the tension, the audience is really interested in how you're going to resolve it, and then you resolve it in a very clean and clear way. People find that very satisfying. Resolution of detention is very psychologically satisfying to a lot of people. Okay, a third way is to have a hero in your story. Now, I'm sure everybody knows that you know classic stories, fictional stories, uh, movies, novels... We understand how heroes play a role in that. However, in scientific stories, not so much, right? People don't think of what's the hero of your scientific story. And I think that you should definitely think about that. Uh, for example, it could be the molecule. The molecule could be the hero of the story. And the villain could be the disease. Or the audience could be the hero. Or a scientist or a group of scientists searching for the solution to these problems that these disease states pose could be the hero of the story. So in the flow of the story could be that this hero faces a number of challenges, and each challenge that they face is a story tension point in the story. So thinking about it this way can allow you to take your existing material and transform it into a hero facing challenges and overcoming challenges. A fourth way to deal, to bring tension into a story is to identify a contradiction or paradox that's involved somewhere in the story. And by that, I mean that you have opposing forces and it's not clear which force is going to win. A good example of that is for many drugs, drug efficacy and drug safety are sometimes in direct opposition to each other. When you increase efficacy, you get safety problems. And when you reduce dose, the dose to, to achieve better safety, you get loss of efficacy. So if there is such a, a, a way of, if there's a situation like that in your story, bring that in as a problem. One way to think about it, and I actually did this in an in a ophthalmology story that we once did, was a rock and a hard place. There are many situations in medicine where, where you have a rock and a hard place kind of metaphor. That if you choose option A, you're going to run into these problems. And if you choose option B, you're, you're going to run into these other problems. Well, which way should you go? And then the new intervention, which is out of the box, helps resolve or at least diminish that, that antagonism between those two options and makes it more clear which option you should take. And then finally, the fifth one, I want to go back to the unmet needs. So when we talk about unmet needs, there are various ways of expressing it, right? You can do it from the perspective of the patient. Patients are frustrated or confused or they're experiencing bad outcomes, or they're distrusting of healthcare professionals for, for whatever reason. Whenever someone's unhappy, uh, whenever someone's running into problems, the patients, that's an opportunity to bring tension into the story. And then on the other side of the fence, healthcare professionals can be overwhelmed, can be frustrated, confused, having difficulties of whatever type. When you can bring that into the story, that will generate tension. 
So I think this is a good time to stop. We've talked about what tension is, why it's important in storytelling, how tension engages audiences and brings them in and connects them to the material in a deeper way, at a psychological level that's deeper, where they, they'll remember it better, they'll be more inclined to share it, and in some situations, they may change their behavior because they're more connected with the material that you're presenting as a story. So there's a lot more to say about bringing the art of um, storytelling into scientific communication. That's what this podcast is about. If there are things that you'd like uh, us to look into more closely, talk about, do a program about, I would love to hear about it. Please like and subscribe to the podcast. And again, this is Dr. Ed Perper with the Art of Scientific Storytelling podcast. Thank you so much for listening and see you next time.